So for this uh, little anthology that we're about to read, uh, we're going to read a book from the golden age of comics, um, Mystic Number no. 6. And uh, the story that we're going to read from this is uh, from Basil Wolverton. And his artwork uh, is absolutely mind-boggling. It is absolutely brilliant. His work is definitely sought after. And um, it's, um, if you have a chance, uh, have a, you know, go online and have a look for it. And the story we're going to read is uh, this one, uh, The Eye of Doom. Okay, and it's the first story in this. And um, it, this series is actually one of the sought after series from the Golden Age. Uh, these are uh, pre comic book code approved basically before censorship hit the comic book industry and it's a long story and we'll get into it um, but um, basically what happened was uh, uh, mainstream society got freaked out some people wrote some articles actually one person wrote a book and said that comic books uh, stories like this horror and um, you know f fear based comic books and stuff like this is a they were uh, polluting the children's mind and what happened was a lot of these types of stories got censored for a few decades uh, soon after this 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 book is named from 1952 and um, I haven't read this story yet I've checked out the artwork and I know uh, Wolverton's work um, I just like the craziness of it it's this very trippy kind of work and he was controversial at the time some people don't like it uh, some people loved it so i'm on the love side of the whole thing of uh, uh what this guy produced uh, and um, i do plan on slowly uh, uh, seeking out more of his work and uh, collecting it and uh, what we're gonna do we're gonna read this i chose this one now, i have a few other uh books like this i actually have um two copies of this one uh, they're both in good condition but we're gonna read this one because this one has uh, uh, tape on it so it's a little bit more sturdy than this one um, and there was a few other books that uh, I thought about reading uh, to you guys from the same sort of uh, genre which is punch comics and this is sought after as well uh, here's mystic number no. five the Wolverton stuff is mystic number no. six um, and definitely EC books, sci-fi, fantasy EC books. And um, what we're about to read with Wolchin is, um, is science fiction horror. Uh, but EC books, I have, I have some EC books. These are the annuals. And these guys are, oh my God, uh, amazing stuff. And at some point, I'm going to come back and um, create a series uh, for EC books. I'm going to read some EC uh, fantasy and horror books but right now I decided to read this one because uh, well I want to have a read through the story and I want to start collecting uh, Wolverton's materials uh, and uh, we're not gonna touch this one because this one is rougher there's no tape on it so I don't know some people consider tape to be restoration for me tape is not restoration tape is just keeping the comic book together it lowers the grade for sure but uh, uh, I don't consider it to be restoration and uh, I love this stuff like the artwork is absolutely magnificent right this is mystic number five horror shadow in the background what is a terrifying mystery of the face fantastic stuff fantastic stuff and this beautiful cover I mean look at this and this is actually a sought after uh, book as well Punch number 14 from the same period. I think this is earlier. I think this is 1940s. I can't remember. Okay. So let's uh, pull this out and have a read through the Eye of Doom. And this is a good, great comic uh, in my book anyway. Um, so I would rate this as a two. Uh, it's appealing um, you know it's got some tape holding it together it's uh, the cover is you know there's little pieces missing you can tell and the tape is here but it's mostly intact 
uh, the pages are intact, the, the comic is intact, the story is intact, which is super important to me. Um, January 6th, 10 cents, Atlas. And this was published by Atlas, and Atlas was uh, branched off into Marvel, or was Marvel. Uh, I looked at the history of the stuff a long time ago, but I can't remember. So what we'll do is, uh, and again, here's the advertisements and the fine print. Let's read the fine print. Mystic is published by Classic Syndicate Incorporated. Um, office publication, they're based in New York second class of new york act of uh, march so they were incorporated uh, this company in 1879 wow additional entry published by monthly copyright 1951 actually um by classic syndicate incorporated fifth avenue new york subscription rate was a dollar 20 for 12 issues so you got 12 issues for dollar 20 and the price tag on this is uh, 10 cents right so that makes sense 10 cents for 12 issues so if you bought a subscription you bought it for if it's published bi-monthly um i'm not sure if this bi-monthly means twice a month or once every two months i think it would be once every two months um but it could be a two-year subscription or a one-year subscription no it should be a two-year subscription 12 issues no similarity between printed in the United States. Okay, let's flip through this uh, like we've done with the other books and then come back and read this uh, story. I mean, take a look at the artwork. This is 1951 we're talking about, right? Absolutely brilliant. And the color scheme is incredible. So this is a sci-fi horror story. Okay, The Eye of Doom. Look at the faces. Wolverton is known for this type of stuff. Trippy faces. Very trippy. Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Polluting children's minds, eh? That's the end of it but we'll come back and read this get a closer look i shall never die a little story continued after next page collectibles so i guess the little right up here is uh intro to this Beautiful stuff. Oh, this is the story for the written, the continued. I shall never die, right? Come back and read these maybe later. Kill these hair destroying gel germs with Ward's formula. Save your hair. See, this isn't. This thing was not geared. These books were not geared towards children. A lot of adults were reading these books and censorship came in, fear, right? Fear took over, media took over, and the industry sort of uh, out of fear and uh, business decisions. Some, you know, superhero comic books weren't selling as much as these types of books were selling, right? To adults. This was amazing entertainment, right? Brilliant stories, intricate stories, adult oriented. And then when censorship kicked in, uh, all of these books, uh, you know, a tremendous amount of stuff was lost. They're staining on this. Eh? I don't know if you can see it. Beautiful. Anyone can learn learn to dance. See, the advertisement is not geared towards kids. Phew. 
she won't stay dead. Uh, seen these in movies, haven't you? A lot of the sci-fi or horror shows, movies that have come out uh, were inspired by books like this. What's this? Oh, a little bank. See, this one's an advertisement for kids. Television bank. Dollar ninety-eight. Oh my God! You could have bought twenty of these books. And these things are expensive. This book. Um, this book is, if it's in mint condition, it runs a few thousand bucks. Um, in this condition. Uh, it's worth somewhere around 100 bucks. A little bit less. Probably in the 70s. Yeah. Now it's a tape just holding it together, an advertisement. Oh, kid advertisements. Cool. Should we have a read through this? Let's have a read through Wolverton's The Eye of Doom. And the first thing I noticed, uh, or first thing that popped into my mind when I saw this was uh, in DC Comics in a series called Legion 89. And there's a character in Legion that is an eye and it's super powerful. And as soon as I saw this, um, when I bought the book, I flipped through it when I bought it right away. And as soon as I saw this, it totally reminded me of that. So I'm curious to see what the similarities are. Okay. So let's have a read through. The Eye of Doom, a classic suspense and terror from the mystic morgue. And it's signed Basil Wolverton. What had happened to Hoyt Gilpin and Lon Ulrich, the two men who two months previously, who two months previously had taken off for, for Venus in their experimental spaceship? It was a mystery, for at that time no one had attempted to travel beyond the moon. My thoughts kept staying to the possible possible fate of the Earthman as I sat alone in the weather station outpost and gazed into the darkening sky. Suddenly I noticed a pe peculiar flash of light against the stars. It must be some kind of ship and it's coming closer. It is a ship, the Gilpin Ulrich spaceship. It's going to land here. I raced out on into the chill night to meet the descending vehicle. And by the time I reached it, rocket smoke had cleared away and the outer airlock door was open. Out came a shockingly haggard figure. He stared strangely at me. Equally strange was his first remark. A welcoming committee of one? How unfortunate for you. You, you're Hoyt Gilpin. Your partner is he? Ulrich? He's still on Venus. I came back alone. Then you, then you did reach Venus. Here? Lean on me. And we'll get up to the weather station building. Inside, Gilpin slept into a chair and nervously figured, fingered the satchel he had brought from his ship. The whole world is waiting news of you. Do you want me to get you 
a connection with a new service? No, no, don't call anyone. The world will soon, soon enough know I'm back. Yes, it will be much too soon. And I'm going, and I'm going to tell you why. Glancing at me occasionally, strangely, glancing at me, glancing at me occasionally, strangely menacing manner, Gilpin began, Gilpin began his story. We made it to Venus, he said, but we had trouble getting through the cloud blanket around the planet. Once we were inside the cloud shell, we saw terrain similar to Earth but all was buried in a gloomy color. We've made it, this is Venus. The gauges indicate breathe, breathable air, Hoyt. Shall we land? We'd better. We'd better requinter first. If there are inhabitants, we'd be running a risk of ambush. Some words here, I don't know. Expecting the peculiar Venetian flora, we saw no sign of any living thing. Then a few miles distance, we spotted something that looked habitable. It looked like a huge building. We'll soon find out. It's a city hollowed out on a hill, but it's deserted. We sped far over the planet's surface and viewed hundreds of cities, but there was no sign of life in any of them. It's a mystery. It couldn't have been war or disease, or they'd be evidence. It's as though the inhabitants just disintegrated. Obviously it's safe to land, then we can have a closer look. We set the ship down by some old inhab uh, habitations, and after a check of conditions, we ventured outside, the first Earthman to set food on, on the warm, humid surface of Venus. Let's explore that structure. This is like entering a tomb. Hoyt, look. Oh, there's a whole bunch of eyes coming towards them. Those giant eyes, the eyes of doom. At long urchus cry, I wheel to see several spherical objects floating over a ridge and coming straight for us. What are they? Balloons? I don't know, but we better get inside this building. Oh, check out the dog coming out of the building. As we ran into the structure, there was a scurry, scurry under our feet, and a rat-like creature raced out the door. Check that out. Propelled by some mysterious force, the round objects already were almost overhead. They were sickly white. They were sickly white, each with a peculiar black spot that rolled like the pupil of a huge eye. One of them, at least six feet wide, dipped down and pounced on the creature that had fled out the door. Like a bubble, the thing settled on its victim, drawing it out of sight through its gelat gelatinous surface and into its interior. Mm. It ate it. The other eye-like entities swarmed against the open door and windows. Their black orb directed balefully at us, directed balefully at us and making ugly hissing sounds. To our horror, we could see them shrinking. If they 
get any smaller, they'll get in. Shoot them. Oh, they got guns. They're shooting them. The bullets zipped harmlessly through the white photoplasmic parts, but when hit in their pupil, the eye beams collapsed and fell to the ground. Soon it was littered with the gelatinous masses. I think that takes care of them. No, others in sight. Let's get out of here before more show up. Oh, we ran for the ship, but the moment we were in the open, one of the creatures concealed on the roof thudded down on Ulrich. I saw him sucked into the carnivore, carnivore's interior. I hesitated to fire, lest I shoot you. Ulrich, there was nothing I could do but flee. The eye moved after me, but I raced inside the ship and seized the controls that closed the airlock doors. I'm safe, but Paul Lon. Oh, Lon is the guy's name. Sick with despair, I fired the rocks and recklessly fired the rockets and recklessly plunged, plunged the ship up through the cloud the cloud shell. Without Ulrich, I didn't care much whether or not I reached Earth. As I turned to make further control adjustments, a shocking sight met my eyes. No, no. Ah, oh, there's an eye inside the ship with them. There, to my horror and dismay, was an eye. Obviously, obviously it was slip. Obviously, had slipped into the ship while we were defending ourselves, and having reduced itself to about the size of a basketball, went unnoticed by me until now. As I reached for my gun, green vapor spewed from the orb and into my face. You devil, I'll blast you too. Arr. Something in that awful vapor paralyzed me instantly. My gun fell to the floor. I was helpless before the, the frightful entity. But the eye didn't touch me. It just floated there in the control cabin, watching me constantly. I wanted to smash the hideous thing, but I lacked the strength. Miserable hours. Miserable hours pass like years. The eye's will was greater than mine. Somehow it injected into my mind what I wanted wanted of it, what it wanted of me. I became its servant, feeding and watering it at intervals. It was evident that these protoplasmic cannibal, cannibals had overrun Venetian civilization, devouring every human, every human being now that particular one had shrewdly planted, planned to travel to another world to prey upon other beings. It wouldn't reach Earth. We're approaching the moon, and I'll crash the ship there. The eye must have discerned my purpose, for when I tried to, to steer the ship into the moon, I found myself powerless to act. I, I can't move. By now, we were close to the, close to Earth. By now, we were close to Earth. My next plan was to deliberately crack, crack up on my native planet. I'll aim for an uninhabited area, and that will be the end of the nightmare. But again, it thwart, but again, I was thwarted. It was the eye's will to land safely, and at the last minute, I found myself ex exerting every effort to make a safe landing so here i am hmm. he says it was apparent 
It was apparent that Gilpin's, Gilpin's long stay in the ship, the ship had left his mind unbalanced. His story was ridiculous. I decided to humor him, though until I could contact the proper authorities. But the eye, where is it now? Don't ask that. Leave now while there's still time before it wills me to, to. Oh, he had the eye in the bag. Check this out. To open the satchel. What the say? If, if this is a gag, all. Oh, ooh, the eye is coming out. To my horror, the object in the satchel rose slowly toward me, and I began and it began to ex and began to expand. It can't be. Behind the eye, Gulpin seemed temporarily free of the eyes. Eyes powers. He seized a pair of shears from my table and rammed them into this cl clammy creature. What happened next was terrible. The eye rolled sharply back over Gilpin. I can't look. Oh, suck them up. And an instant later, all I saw of him was a pro protruding hand. Still expanding, it turned on me. I was cornered. I seized the phone and ripped it clo loose. I would have hurled it at the malignant, malignant pupil, but a green vapor spewed out and I was powerless. <sighs> then I felt the horrible slimy touch of his proplasmic body pressing over me. Brilliant story, brilliant story. Like really, absolutely fantastic. And this is what was being published as a comic book in 1952. And this is what censorship destroyed in the United States. Right. Basil Wolverton. Fantastic story. What we'll do is um, we'll leave it there. These are... Uh, I ended up grabbing six anthologies, sort of collections of work, and uh, we've read six, six books so far. And if this is the first one you're reading, there's five other anthologies I've put together. And um, there are three from the Golden Age, one late, early Silver Age, late Golden Age, from the 1940s, uh, 45, one from 1948, this one's 19, uh, no, sorry, one from 1945, one from, this is 1952, um, one from 1958, and we got two books from 1982, and uh, we got one book from 1990, and, uh, and we'll read more Golden Age sci-fi or horror books, okay? But for now, uh, those are the readings that we've put together. I hope you enjoy, and uh, I guess I'll see you guys in the next video. Bye for now.